Good evening, and thank you. I'm conscious that uh, this is your evening, um, so um, I will hopefully make it useful. It feels slightly strange being this side of a lecture theatre, which um, I hope you'll forgive me for. Um, and I, so Rehab's told you about me. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about me. But um, when I was thinking about what I was going to say, I was thinking, well, I could talk to you for ages and ages and ages about all sorts of different things. But actually, this is your time. So um, what you want to talk about, what you want to ask about, whatever, that's kind of much more important than what I think you might want to hear about. So I guess what I would say is, well, I'll talk for a bit, but please ask questions and we'll leave lots of time for questions. And, and I have been around a little bit. Um, and I do know law firms, and I don't work in a law firm anymore, so you can ask me whatever you like, and I will hopefully tell you some truths that you know you might not hear elsewhere, so feel free to ask me, and if I feel slightly embarrassed about anything, I'll tell you, but um, I, I, yeah. So um, what I thought I'd do was tell you a little bit about me, um, and then talk a little bit about... A little bit about stress, because that's kind of a big thing, which I guess some of you will be experiencing already with exams coming up and things like that. Um, and uh, where it comes from, and how we can understand it a little bit better, how we can manage ourselves a bit better. Um, and I thought I might talk to you a little bit about the Mindful Business Charter, which we have mentioned, which is an initiative in the legal profession, which is trying to do something about mental health in the profession, if that makes sense. Um, and we'll put some context around and stuff like that. But as I say, if you want to, I mean, interrupt me, ask questions, disagree, whatever. Um, I'm very relaxed. So um, that's, that's the book that Reha mentioned, which is obviously my opportunity to plug um, me. Are you in the right place? You're uh, mental health in the law. No. <laughs> Don't think so. Um, so me. Uh, I, so uh, I could tell you loads, I won't. Um, a few stories. So I was, as, as Rehab said, I was here at Cats in 1988 to 91, study law. Uh, I was a really good boy. I have always been a really good boy. Uh, from a very young age, I learned to do as I was told. I learned to work hard. I learned to keep out of trouble. Uh, and there are all sorts of reasons why I did that. Um, but partly that explains why I ended up here, because I've worked really hard. Um, and, and then having got here, uh, I got a relative good degree, got a T1, uh, and I joined um, a firm called Goulden's, which at that stage was a firm a bit like McFarland's. I don't know if that rings any bells, but it was kind of a medium-sized firm, but kind of punching above its weight. And it was different. It was a very different kind of culture to most law firms. Um, and I did pretty well, though. Um, but I'll tell you a story, which uh, I was reminded of today, because um, somebody was talking about it. But, um, in about six months into my training contract, we, we called it articles in those days, but six months into my training contract, um, I was feeling utterly overwhelmed with the amount of work I had to do. I was feeling, yeah, like I couldn't cope. I was in the office late one evening in tears because I was thinking, I can't do this. And uh, my boss was a completely laid back bloke and he wasn't around at that time of the evening, so I couldn't go and talk to him. So I went to talk to him in the next morning and I went into his room and said, Conrad, I can't cope. And uh, he looked at me and said, Okay, tell me, tell me everything you've got to do. And I said, I've got all of this to do. And he said, is that it? And I said, no, I've got all of this to do as well. He said, okay, is that it? I said, yeah, I think that's about it. He said, okay, what's the most important of all of that? And I said, well, this is. He said, okay, go and do that then. And I went and did it and I came back and he said, have you done it? And I said, yes. He said, okay, well, what's, ne what's next most important? And I, that story is an interesting experience because it's probably the most helpful conversation I ever had in a law firm. Um, that I felt utterly unable to cope with the amount of stuff I had on. I thought, like, yeah. And, and, and then, then with that, you start panicking. You're thinking, oh my God, I'm a failure and everyone's going to notice. And um, yeah, I never really was good enough. It's all been a bit pretense and whatever. When in reality, most people struggle. Most people find it hard. Most people go through times when it's just like, this is just too much. Um, and part of the problem is that we don't actually mention it. Right? We don't talk about it. We don't feel brave enough to actually say, hang on, I'm finding it a bit difficult right now. Um, and I think that's particularly so when you, for some people at least, and we're all different, but when you make the transition from somewhere like here to a law firm or barristers' chambers or whatever it may be, and you've... You know, you've probably been pretty good at school, that's why you've got here. You've then worked your asses off here to get your degree, and, and then you go and get a job. And the idea that suddenly everyone else around you is as clever as everybody here is, or cleverer, um, 
and nobody's really kind of admitting to finding things difficult or nobody's really admitting to feeling vulnerable or weak or human, it can be really, really hard. Um, and learning to kind of acknowledge that is quite, I think, quite important. And a lot of the work that we're doing right now is around that kind of stuff. So that was 93, 94. Um, fast forward 17 years or something. Um, and by that stage, I would have been a really good boy for a long time. Um, and I was now uh, a father. I had three kids who were at that age, goodness knows how old. They're now 23, 20, and 17. Um, the, I was a partner, which, you know, that's a big job. Um, I was running, I was on the firm's management committee. My next job was going to be running the firm. That was the plan. Uh, had a lovely big house, lovely family, obviously. Uh, mentioned that. Uh, we just bought a house in France. It was going really well. Um, we, I was one of these people who said yes to everything. So I was on the kind of the school governing body. I was this, I was that. I was just doing everything. And anybody who looked at me would have said, he's doing fine, isn't he? And everyone would have said, he's happy and he's, you know, isn't he doing well? And I probably thought that too. Um, and the, uh, I, I, know, I knew that I was a little bit under pressure. I knew that sometimes I felt a bit stressed, but I thought, well, you know, of course I'm a bit stressed. I've got a big job, haven't I? And I've got three kids, and I've got this and I've got that. Of course I'm a bit stressed, but it'll be all right, won't it? Just kind of keep your head down, crack on, it'll be all right. Um, and then, kind of early 2011, and this is another one of those conversations that you kind of remember, you think, hmm, that was an interesting conversation. So early 2011, I am being, I'm being groomed to be the next managing partner, so the kind of chief executive or whatever the law firm. And the and you know everyone thinks I'm others. Um, and the I, they said, why don't you go and see a coach? Because a coach will help you kind of I don't know, develop your management skills and whatever. I thought fine. So I saw the coach, um, and he was a lovely bloke. And after a few sessions, so with coaching, you kind of talk to somebody. It's just like a private little conversation, really, um, a couple of hours a week or whatever. And after a few sessions, he said, okay. I think I know you quite well, Richard. I think I understand you. Um, and I know your law firm very well too. And I know all the people here pretty well. I can absolutely understand why the law firm wants you to be the next managing partner. I completely understand that. What I don't understand is what you want. And I, I looked at him and said, Peter, what do you mean? What do you mean, what do I want? I've got a wife, I've got three kids, I've got a mortgage, I've got a pension, I've got this, I've got that, I've got a team, I've got clients, I've got this, I've got responsibilities coming out of my ears. What do you mean, what do I want? And, and he looked at me in a kind of kind, supportive way that said, I think you might want to think about that. Um, and I realised, I suppose at that point, or sometime after that, that I'd never really stopped to think, what do I, what, what really matters to me? Um, I'd done what people wanted me to do, and I'd done it pretty well. Um, but I'd got to age, whatever that was, 41, having done what others wanted me to do. And I don't think, I'm not saying that the, um, that moment was a kind of, that, that that caused me to have a breakdown, it didn't, but it was probably catalytic in terms of me, my illness becoming apparent. Um, my brain works in kind of images. So I, if you imagine building a house, and you start building, you start with your foundations. Um, and then you kind of, once you've got your foundations done, you then start building up your foundations. And then gradually over time, you extend and you redevelop and you do this and you do that. And 20 years later, you've got this massive, massive ed edifice of a life sitting there. And then one day somebody comes along and says, you know those foundations, they're not there. Um, and it was a little bit like that, him saying, I don't, just don't know what you want. I don't know why you're doing this. Um, because none of the things that matter to me, none of the values, none of the sense of purpose that I had were being met at all by being the managing partner of the law. So I went on holiday in the May half term of 2011 um, with the family to France. And on the way back, had, uh, we were driving around the peripherique south of Paris. And, and suddenly I felt desperately ill. Um, and there were some warning signs, but I didn't really notice them. So basically, the first thing I knew was we're driving on the motorway, and there's lots of fast-moving traffic all around us. And I'm driving, and suddenly I think, I've got to get out of here. So I stopped the car and got out and started walking across lots of lanes of fast-moving traffic, which obviously wasn't very sensible, until somebody said, Monsieur, what are you doing? 
And I said, I've got no idea. Um, and I, so they took me to hospital and they did later tests on me and then said, yeah, uh, we can't find anything wrong with your heart. So go back to England and then go and see your cardiologist in the morning. Um, because we've all got our own cardiologist in there. So um, I went to see my GP in the morning who said, yeah, I don't think it's your heart, Mr. Martin, I think it's your head. Um, I think you've had a panic attack. And I had no idea what he was talking about, um, but I soon learned. And I'd gone, so we were away for a week, and I never went back to law um, after that week. I had, you know, before we went away, I had been somebody who could walk into any kind of office, any building. I had no fear of anything. I could take on any cases. I was, you know, whatever. I just, I, I was managing, and I was doing stuff, and I was, you know, and then suddenly I was terrified of the dog park. I was terrified when the doorbell rang. I was literally crying behind the sofa to when anybody came to the house. I was a, I was a complete wreck. Um, and it happened in the space of a few very short weeks. Um, so I ended up, after not very long trying to cope at home, my family said, we can't manage with you here. So I went to hospital. Um, and there's, again, one of those conversations that's quite enlightening. The, my psychiatrist, because I had a psychiatrist by this point, my psychiatrist said, would you like to be admitted to hospital? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know about this stuff, I'm not a doctor. Um, and he said, no, no, it's all about what you want. Okay. So I asked, him, I asked him, am I ill enough to be admitted to hospital? He said, yeah, yeah, you are definitely ill enough to be admitted to hospital. Okay, he said, what are they like in there? Because we kind of have these images of what psychiatric hospitals might be like. I said, what are they like? He said, well, they're like you. And, and, I, and when I went to hospital, sure enough, they were like me. They weren't other people. They weren't weird. They weren't, you know, whatever. They were just people like us. Um, and I think one of the things that we, one of, the, one of the issues around mental health and mental illness is that because we don't talk about it, because we're not taught about it, and we don't talk with our families about it or with our tutors or whatever it may be, we don't know anything about it. And so we kind of hide it away in the cupboard and think it's about other people. And it isn't. It's about people like us. Um, and the people in the priory, where I spent a good month, um, were just people like us. We were just struggling to cope at that time. So I spent a bit of time there and spent a long time getting better. Um, and then eventually thought, right, I need to do some work. I can't. Can I swear on a lecture? Can I do that? Um, I thought I can't spend my life pissing about on the sofa. So I decided I needed to do something. Um, and I thought, what I'm going to do is something along the following lines. I'd been an employment lawyer, uh, and so I'd been used to dealing with the problems that happen in workplaces. That's what employment lawyers kind of do. Um, and whenever there was a problem in a workplace, I'd always thought, what you need is an employment lawyer. That's the answer to problems in workplaces. So I spent 20 years you know, throwing employment law at problems in workplaces. Now, employment law is important, but it's not everything. Um, and having been in hospital, and then having spent quite a lot of time understanding how this works, I was beginning to think, ah, it's not, the reason why things happen, the reason why people do stuff is not because of the law or anything like that, it's because of this. So if we can understand this a little bit more, then we might be able to help understand why things happen in workplaces and we might be able to stop things, bad things happening and things like that. So I thought, using my experience as a person, as a human being, as an employee, as a manager, as a lawyer, and also using counselling and psychotherapy insight from kind of understanding this a little bit more, I could look at things in the workplace in a kind of slightly different way, looking through a load of different lenses rather than just through a lens of employment law. Um, and before very long, somebody said, um, you should talk to Fern Dean. So that BD at the top left is, that is Bern Dean, that's who I work for. And we're all basically ex-employment lawyers who got tired of dealing with the nonsense that employment, law, that employment lawyers have to deal with, the kind of discrimination, bullying, harassment claims, and thought, wouldn't it be more interesting to try to create cultures in workplaces in which people don't do that stuff, um, in which people are kinder, fairer, and more productive. So we do lots of work with all sorts of different kinds of organisations around kinder, fairer, more productive workplaces. We know what the law is, we know how things can go wrong, but we look to try to prevent that happening. And we work with lots of law firms and then lots and lots of other sorts of organisations, lots of banks and other financial institutions, lots of insurers, lots of media companies. We work across the UK and internationally and blah, blah, blah. I was supposed to be in Singapore last week, but that got cancelled because of the virus. So we do lots of international stuff. Um, so that's a bit about me. Um, 
And I would it's easy to it's easy to think that um, that mental illness runs a bit like this, that you, you you're well and then you get ill and then you get better and then if you're really odd you write a book about it and then everything's fine. Um, and off you, you know, we all live happily ever after. And that's absolute bollocks. The, the idea that I've got better and therefore I'm fine for the rest of my life is absolute nonsense. And even though I spend most of my life in rooms, not quite as grand or as big as this, but in rooms talking about mental health and talking about trying to make, help everybody being more aware of their mental health, I still have problems. Um, and in early this year, after having not slept properly for about six, six weeks, I had to take a couple of weeks off work because I was just completely blown out. Um, it's better now, but um, it's something that we all have to uh, manage, I guess. So that's a little bit about me. Um, you can ask me stuff if you want, or we can do that at the end. Let's do it at the end, but if you want to ask me stuff, please. A um, little bit of context about law. So... I don't know if you, I don't know how familiar you are with kind of stats around mental health. Uh, that thing on the left is a, um, the idea that we all have a state of mental health. We're all on the spectrum. We have good days, bad days. We might be really healthy. Sometimes we might, sometimes we're feeling a bit rubbish. And other times we might actually be kind of on the left-hand side of that. But the idea that we all have a state of mental health, we're all on the spectrum. And there are lots of stats that say, oh, one in four of the adult population in any one year would experience a diagnosable mental illness. Yes, that's true. Um, and that's really important to remember. Um, the reality is that we all have a state of mental health. Um, the, the most important stat, I think, is one in one. We should all be thinking about this. Um, but lawyers are particularly in danger. Um, so, and I don't say this to scare you, but I say this just to kind of put a bit of context around this and say this is something that you know, lawyers and law firms should be really focused upon. Um, and I'm... So, uh, Law Society England and Wales, Junior Lawyers Division, so that's five years post-qualification experience and less, fewer. So, people up to about, I don't know, age 30, something like that. Um, they do a survey every year. Um, and this was the results from 2019. That just under half of lawyers across, uh, solicitors across the profession in the previous month had experienced a mental health problem. Which is pretty scary. Um, most of them didn't feel, feel they could talk to their employer about it. A significant number feeling suicidal. Um, and three quarters experiencing disrupted sleep. There is a real, um, well, I'll use the word because I use it when I'm talking to law firms. There is a crisis in the profession at the moment. Um, and we need to be taking it seriously. I think if... Um, if this was any other profession, any other industry, reporting figures like this, the law, the legal profession would be all over them in terms of you know shutting them down. The only reason law firms get away with it is they're the lawyers. Um, it's yeah, and it's the same internationally. So there's data from Australia, data from the US. Um, I was saying to uh, Brendan, I was speaking at a conference in Seoul in October. Um, which was the International Bar Association, so lawyers from all around the world. Um, and it's finally, you know, this subject is finally getting a the agenda globally. Um, so it's an issue. Thankfully, it is an issue that people are beginning to recognise and do something about. So there is some good news, which we'll come on to. Um, any questions about that? As a, and, and these stats, you know, this is not other law firms. This is your clipper chances, your slaughter and maze, yeah, whatever, the law firms we know. Um, the, so, so what's going on? Um, we could do an exercise, but I won't. Um, stress. Who's experienced stress? Yeah, it's part of, part of life. We all get it. Um, what kind of, what, what, what does it feel like to be stressed? Give me some words. Overwhelming. Overwhelming? What happens to your thinking? Frantic. Frantic, yeah. How effective is it? 
Um, it's not very effective at all. The, um, we talk about stress quite a lot. Um, I one day decided I wanted to understand what it meant. So I Googled what does stress mean, and there's about 50,000 definitions of stress. But the one that, I didn't read them all, but the one that kind of resonated with me was this, that stress is the state of mind we get into when we think we can't cope. When we think that more is being asked of us than we can do. When we think the demands upon us are exceeding our resources. That makes sense. Um, and there are two bits to that definition. One is the kind of the demands and the resources, and that's important. Um, but the critical thing, I think, is, is it's what we think. It doesn't matter whether I'm right or wrong. If I think that more is being asked of me than I can do, if I think that the demands are greater than I can do, I will feel stressed. Um, doesn't matter whether I'm right or wrong. And when we feel stressed, our thinking starts going haywire. Um, and what we tend to do is two things. We exaggerate the demands. We think that there are more of them, that they're more time critical, that if I don't get that essay in, I'm going to be beaten alive by my supervisor, and then my parents will be told, and then, 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 you know, whatever, 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 and my life will be from there. Um, so we exaggerate the demands. And at the same time, we start underestimating our resources. Um, and, and I think we do that in two ways. First of all, we lose confidence in ourselves. Because our thinking goes a bit haywire, we lose confidence in our own ability to do stuff. But critically, and I don't know, this may not be as apparent to you now, but it will be when you're in an organisation, you don't think you can talk to anybody else about it. So even though I might be surrounded by one of the most highly skilled teams in one of the most highly regarded professional service firms in the entire world, I don't ask for help. I think I better shut up and keep quiet and not admit that I'm struggling. And so I lose sight of all of the resources around me. That makes sense. So at the same time as we're exaggerating the demands, we're underestimating the resources. And it's in that gap that our stress lies. And the longer we're there, the bigger that gap becomes. Um, and most of it is about this. And if you sit down with anybody who's stressed and say, let's talk about it, you'll generally find that they are exaggerating the demands and they're underestimating the resources. And if they're not, then you take away some of the demands and you give them some resources. But most of the time, they've got their perspective out of guilty. Um, if that makes some sense. We might look at that a bit more in a moment. What's going on um, in our brains with this is quite basic, and this may be nothing new to you. The oldest bit of our brain is the amygdala. A little bit of our brain sits at the top of our spinal column, and it hasn't evolved at all. It was there when we were reptiles, and it hasn't changed since. And it hasn't changed since because it's really good at what it does. And what it does is pretty simple. It's there to protect us from harm. It's there to alert us when we're in danger and to get us ready to deal with the danger. Um, and what happens is that when we perceive ourselves to be in danger, the amygdala automatically gets triggered. We don't have to be aware of the threat as soon as we become even unconsciously aware of the threat, the amygdala gets triggered. But because it's primitive, because it's prehistoric, it assumes that any threat is one of those. Um, now, in London at least, we don't get many of those. But that's what's going on in our bodies the whole time. What would you do if you're facing one of those? I know this is law, not biology, but... You will fight for it. You'll fight? Or run, fight or flight. You might freeze, you might fold, but fight or flight are the two most common things. And what are you going to do if you want to run away or fight? What do you need? More basically, what do you need? More basically. If I want to run really fast, I need lots of energy. Where do I need it? In my legs. And if I'm going to fight, I need it in my... So our bodies are really clever. When, the, when we perceive ourselves to be under threat, and as I say, we don't have to be consciously aware of the threat, and it doesn't matter whether we're right or wrong, once we think we're under threat, the amygdala is triggered, floods our body with adrenaline and other hormones, and their job is to create the physiological changes necessary to get us ready to run away or fight. So our breathing goes up, get more oxygen in, heart rate goes up, get that blood pumping around the body, we release more glucose um, into our blood, all very sensible. 
And then something really clever happens, um, which we're less aware of. But the arteries to unimportant parts of our body narrow to reduce the amount of blood and energy going there and to maximize the amount of blood going to our arms and legs, which is really clever when you think about it. Um, so the body basically shuts down bits of our system that aren't important, like our digestive system or our bowel and bladder control. Not important when you're facing a tiger. But the most critical bit that it shuts down is our brain. Um, because I don't need to be able to like, do complicated law when I'm facing a tiger. I need to run like hell. So the blood supply to our brain is reduced when we feel under threat. Um, and our, the bit of our brain that stops first is our prefrontal cortex, the bit of our brain that does our clever conscious thinking. Which is why our thinking goes frantic because our brain is just shutting down. Um, which is fine when you're facing a tiger. But the problem is we don't anymore. We face our supervisors, our tutors, we face our director of studies, we face our bosses, we face clients, we face the courts, we face the other side on the transaction, we face whatever. None of them are going to attack us physically. But we behave as if they are. And we get ready to run away or fight them. Um, which isn't very helpful. And we can't do much about it, really. It's just the way we're made. We're not going to evolve anytime soon. But we need to kind of understand that that's what's going on. Um, does that make sense? So, and if you think about stress, and obviously, you know, what's going on there, that tiger, that's when we feel under threat. I don't think there is a bigger threat that we face as kind of budding professionals than the idea that we may not be able to cope. The idea that I'm going to be found out and that actually, yeah, I am a bit of a fraud after all um, and I'm not as clever as I thought and no, I don't know all the answers and blah, blah, blah. That is a huge, huge kind of existential threat to any of us. Stress is a really big trigger for this. When you feel stressed, oh my goodness, you know, you think you're facing a tiger. So there's lots of stuff around it in terms of symptoms. And I'm guessing that some of this stuff will be stuff that you recognise. Um, in terms of your own experience. I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is the kind of stuff that happens. And this is why, and this is because, so in terms of how we think and feel, this is because the blood supply to our brain is being shut down. So you can't remember stuff. You can't concentrate. You can't make decisions. Um, not sleeping. Anybody have sleep problems? And sleeplessness causes its anxiety in itself. Those two things feed off each other. But it, it makes sense. If you're facing a tiger, don't fall asleep. You'll get eaten. So when you're anxious, you don't sleep. Um, lots of stuff um, our dreams they can often tell us some quite useful stuff so lots of stuff about how we think and feel these are all kind of physical oh sorry these are all symptoms to sort of be on the lookout for but, you know, stuff around how our body reacts physically how we behave this is all the response to you know, an imagined saber tooth tiger but as I say it could be exams it could be all sorts of things that trigger this um, this isn't always the most helpful reaction Knowing that is quite important. What I think is most important is, is this, that all of that starts with us thinking I'm under threat. If I perceive myself to be under threat, if I think there's a threat, then my amygdala gets triggered. This is all about how our brains work. It's all about what we perceive to be a threat. Um, now, this is a little model, which I don't know, it might resonate or not. Uh, we use it a lot um, in our training to think about how we can cope. Um, and it's very simple. It's a bucket, as you can tell, with a little tap on the side of it. And the idea of this model is if I can cope, we all have a bucket into which all of our shit flows, our, all of our worries, our difficulties. And it doesn't matter where they're coming from, our families, our friends, our love life, our exams, our this, our that. It's all going into the same bucket. Donald Trump, all going into the same bucket. And if we can cope, if we can keep our stuff in our bucket, then we're coping. If our stuff starts overflowing our bucket, that's when we're getting into difficulty, if that makes sense. So what we need to do is we need to keep the stuff in our bucket. Does that make sense? Um, and this is it, it doesn't matter what else, it's all, coming, it's all going to the same bucket. What three things will determine whether or not my stress overflows my bucket? Being as literal as you like. The size of my bucket. 
If I've got a big bucket, I can get loads of stuff in it. The amount of stuff coming in, yeah. Third thing is that tap. How do you let stuff out? So what do you think goes to how big your bucket is? If you've got a massive bucket, you can chuck a load of stuff in it. How, how do you make a bigger bucket? Look at this as a positive thing. How can you make a bigger, how can you make yourself more able to cope? How can you boost your resilience or reduce your vulnerability? Self-confidence. Self-confidence. Experience as well would help with that. So if you've done stuff before, you might know. Um, sleep is going to be a massive thing. You know, imagine how much more able you're, how much more you're able to cope with if you've had a good night's sleep compared to if you haven't. Um, what we eat and drink, that goes to you know our resilience. Um, our friendships, our support networks, our sense of purpose. Um, what else? How much drink, how much alcohol we drink, how much caffeine we have, how much nicotine we have, all of that will affect the size of our bucket. Um, the weather, if it's, if it's sunny, we feel better. Bigger bucket. Rates of depression are higher in the winter because we get less sunlight. Our skin converts sunlight to vitamin D. Um, so getting outside is good for us. Um, there'll be some genetics and other things in there as well. But what about that tap? How do you relieve stress, do you think? How do you get stuff out of your bucket? What do you do when you're feeling stressed that's helpful? Or even that's not helpful? Procrastinate, yeah. That's probably not helpful, but yeah. <laughs> but it's a very common trait, and it's a very legal, uh, very lawyerly trait to procrastinate. Uh, and it comes from perfection, perfectionism. That if I, you know, I don't want to, if I don't think I can do something perfectly, I will not do it. Um, There's lots of things that might relieve stress. This was some research done a while back by, it was government commission research, looking at how do um, people who cope, people who seem to be able to manage life, what are they doing that the rest of us could learn from? And they took the, the top five behaviours. Um, and they took the top five because they wanted to mirror our five fruit and veg day. But the idea of, and the, a lot of wellbeing programmes in organisations are based upon these five things. Um, and it's not rocket science. The idea is that if we can do all of these, oh yeah, um, sorry, uh, we can keep our tap flowing. We can get that stress out of our bucket. So being active, exercise. And this doesn't have to be um, taekwondo or whatever that jumper is. Um, it doesn't have to be anything vigorous. Just walking can be quite enough. Um, 30 minutes exercise, four times a week, positive impacts on our well-being. Connection, talking to people. Having good inter interpersonal relationships is really important for our well-being. Kind of makes sense, we know that. Um, learning, who knew? Being at uni is good for you. Um, but it's, you know, our brains are um, curious, our brains like to explore. And if we, if you imagine doing the same thing day in, day out, it's pretty dull and you'll soon feel pretty shit. Um, whereas if you are able to explore and learn and be curious and, you know, whatever, good for us. Giving. One of those, there's a lot of research now around the positive benefits to us of altruism. If we look after somebody else, we feel better, which is nice. Um, and obviously that can be in all sorts of different ways, but you know, simple stuff, being nice to your neighbor. Um, and taking notice. Um, did anybody do any meditation, mindfulness? A little bit, maybe. Um, yeah, a bit. Just spending more time in the present moment, spending more time just noticing what's going on. Um, we spend so much of our lives worrying about tomorrow or yesterday. Um, which we can't do anything about. Um, and when we're thinking about tomorrow or yesterday, we worry. But all we can do with right now is be in it. Um, so if we can spend more time kind of in the present moment, and it could be through meditative practice, whatever, but just I don't know, paying attention, taking notice. You know, when you go for a walk, actually noticing what the weather's doing, noticing the seasons, noticing, yeah. Um, something I was doing for a long time again, um, and I always thought I was one of these people too that wanted that. You feel that the more that you take on, the better you are at getting things done. Like the more stressed I feel, the more productive I am. So how is it that we're taught to sort of toe that line between taking on too much um, and then taking off enough to make sure taking on enough to make sure that we feel like productive? If you map, lovely question. Um, what was I trying to do? If you map um, pressure. 
and productivity. Exactly. Or for that, you could have happiness as well, probably. But we all have a graph that looks a bit like that. Not that graph? Uh, what do you call that? A normal distribution. Normal distribution curve. How many can understand? There you go. <laughs> and we're all, so we all have that. And um, we all have that sweet spot here where it's not too hot and not too cold, where the pressure's just about right. Because um, what here, if you haven't got anything to do, you don't do anything. Uh, or if you haven't got very much to do, somehow you manage to you know, piss out a whole day without getting anything done whatsoever. Um, if we don't have enough to do, we don't do anything. But equally, obviously, when we get too much pressure, so it's finding that, that sweet spot. We all need pressure, but it's just not having too much. If that makes sense. And when you, when you start getting into that territory, and that's really where stress lies, when you start getting to that, that's when you're experiencing a lot of those symptoms around anxiety sort of all the time. You know, if you're always finding it hard to concentrate, if you're always not sleeping well, if you're always irritable, if you're always, you know, whatever, that's a good sign that you're here. Um, does that make, does that? And we all have a graph like this, and it moves. So, you know, if I think about, this can make me sound really old and patronizing, but if I think about standing in front of a lecture theater like this when I was 18, God knows would I have done that. You know, I'd have been absolutely bricking myself, but now I can do it. So my curve has moved along a bit. Um, but equally, yeah, there are times when I, you know, most, most of the time my curve might be here. Sometimes I might be struggling a little bit and it'll be here. Um, but we all have something that changes like that. Learning to say, it's getting a bit hard. Um, to ourselves, first of all, admit that. Um, and then to somebody else. Lawyers. Lawyers get stressed, don't they? And they haven't got enough to do. So they think, oh my God, I haven't got enough work to do, and therefore that must mean that I'm a rubbish lawyer, and you know, I'm going to get sacked. Um, not all lawyers, but sometimes. The, um, and that can be quite, you know, finding that, and of course, you, you never know. There's that lovely expression, don't bite off more than you can shoot, which is perfect, except you don't know until you have. If that makes sense. You don't know until you have. <laughs> um, but once you have bitten off more than you can shoot, take it out, because otherwise you'll choke. Um, you know, if you find yourself here, stop doing some stuff. Get off the stuff. And probably when you are finding yourself here, the first thing to do is to stop and think, hang on, this isn't a very good place. So that stuff is all about how we keep our tap flowing. And weirdly, you know, if you think about that model and think about being really busy, so I've got loads of stuff on and my bucket's really full. What we tend to do then is to say, well, I haven't got time to exercise, and I haven't got time to see my friends, and I haven't got time to be nice to somebody, and I haven't got time for any of this stuff because I've just got so much to do. It's when our bucket is full that we need this stuff more than ever, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, could we say, like, you know, I've heard many, I hear many people saying they're busy, always, and to meet up, uh, I need to plan that three, three weeks in advance, say. Uh, in my perspective, I don't see them as busy because I know people who are really busy, say, like co-founder of startups that are really genuinely busy. Mm. Other people that say they're busy, I don't think they're busy. I think they don't prioritize well in terms of, you know, they say they're busy, but they don't prioritize well their own well-being in terms of being active, in terms of being altruistic, in terms of learning. Mm. I think that's absolutely right. The most successful people are people who look after themselves. And then I think there's something else, um, which um, come on to. Um, but taking yourself seriously enough, caring about yourself enough to actually take care of yourself is hugely important because nobody else is going to do it. Um, I spent quite a lot of time assuming that somebody else would look after me. No, nobody else will. You've got to do it, which is fine. But you've got to actually take time and efforts to do it. So that's about how you let stuff out of your bucket. What about the stuff coming in? Um, anybody know who that bloke is? 
No, but kind of similar kind of Epictetus, um, who was a Greek philosopher, who um, famously said this: "It's not events that causes our difficulties, but how we think about them. It's not the world that causes our problems; it's how we think about them." Um, there was a lot of so we've just been through the whatever it is, seventh fifth anniversary of the liberation of the concentration camps. Um, and if you read any of the philosophy that came out from the, the Jewish philosophers who survived those camps, they will say this, they'll say, we had no control over what happened to us. We had absolutely no control about the way we were treated. All we could do was control how we responded to it. And notwithstanding the way that we were being treated, notwithstanding the complete inhumanity with which we were being treated in those, in those camps, we responded with humanity. To ourselves, to our fellow prisoners, and even to the guards, we responded with humility. And it's that that kept us alive. Um, it's not events that causes our problems, it's how we respond to it, if that makes sense. It's not events that, how, it's not the world that fills our bucket, but how we think about it. So, to come back to what you were saying, the reason why some people seem to be able to cope with a load of stuff, some of it is about how they think. It's not, does that make sense? Um, you know, if I think, if I think it's fine, I, I know all of my contract law, um, and yes, there's an exam tomorrow, but I know I've learned it all and I've got it all off pat, then I won't feel so worried about that exam. If, however, I think I haven't done any revision whatsoever and I think I'm really daft, then I will feel really worried about that exam. Neither is right or wrong necessarily, but it's all about how I think. It's not the exam itself that is affecting how I'm reacting to it, it's how I think about it. That makes sense. Um, which is this. Um, I better shut up soon. Um, ABC. This is uh, CBT. Anybody familiar with CBT? Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. It's yeah. a form of therapy. Um, it's one of many, but it's useful for this model. This explains how, we, how our brains work. Something happens and we respond to it. Um, and we tend just to notice those things. So, I don't know, uh, our tutor comes into the room and we start feeling worried. A tiger and I run away. It's not the tutor that makes me scared. It's not the tiger that makes me run away. It's, it's what I think about it. It's my beliefs. If, you know, what, what happens when I see a tiger? Um, I think we have a different... Different example. So I'm sitting in my room and Brendan's my boss uh, and Brendan phones me up and I start getting worried. Imagine that last week Brendan had asked me to do some report and I haven't done it. Brendan phones me up, activating event, something happens. I start feeling scared. Why am I feeling scared? What am I thinking that's making me feel scared at that point? Last week, he asked me to do a report, and I haven't done it. And now he's phoning me up. Let's go back a few steps. First of all, I'm thinking, he's phoning me up about the report. Secondly, he's going to find out that I haven't done it. Thirdly, he's going to be angry. Fourthly, I'll get fired. Fifthly, well, probably then my wife will leave me, and then I'll have to live on a dark half bench, and I'll die by the thing with a little coronavirus or something. Um, I probably shouldn't be joking about crying, I should be annoying it. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, it's not Brendan phoning me up, the activating event, that makes me scared. It's all of those thoughts. I don't know why he's phoned me up. I've got no idea why he's phoned me up. But my brain has decided it's because he wants to know about the report. That's why he's phoned me up. And then I'm going through all those steps. I don't know whether that's true. But now I'm sitting in my room, shit scared and my brain is now not working. Which isn't very good, because my boss is on the phone. And we do this all the time, you know, not necessarily with our bosses, but with our tutors or whatever. Um, he might be phoning me up to say, Richard, that report I asked you to do, don't worry about it, we don't need it anymore. He might be phoning me up to say, Richard, I just wanted to say how lovely you are. I don't know, but our brains tell us, no, no, he's phoning me up because I'm in trouble. It's not the event that causes us our problems. It's what we think about it. That leads us to being scared. 
And that then triggers the amygdala, which then triggers us to be blah, blah, blah. Um, so if we can capture those beliefs, if we can understand how this works, then we can do something about feeling anxious and stressed, if that makes any sense. Um, and there are some really common, we all have our own messed up nonsense in here, and that's what therapy is about. But, um, and we could spend some time talking about that if you like. But um, there are some really common thinking patterns that we all do a bit of. And um, these, if you think about these, think, these thought patterns, if you, were, if you think about people who are stressed, and believe me, in a law firm environment, you know, there are quite a lot of people stressed. And you talk to them, and I do this a lot, you talk to them about, tell me why you're worried. Tell me what you're stressed about. It will be riddled with these thinking patterns. So first of all, catastrophizing. Worst case scenario, you know, it's gonna, making a mountain out of a mail hole, worrying about everything that could possibly go wrong. Um, everyone does this, but lawyers are paid to do this. That is a lawyer's job, is to worry about everything that could possibly go wrong and then to stop it happening, or at least to provide what should happen in that situation. That's what we do. And the more we do it, like anything, you know, the more you practice, the easier it becomes. And the more you do it automatically. If that makes sense. You know, when you, anybody play the piano? Or a musical instrument of any kind? You know, when you first start doing it, I know this because I'm trying to learn the piano at the moment, I have to think about every single note. And if you've got to think about every single note, it sounds shit. But when you look at a concert pianist, they're not thinking about every note because they've done it loads. They don't have to think about it. The more you catastrophize as your job, the more you're going to do that. Um, Personalisation, the way it's all about us. It's all my fault. Or if something's gone wrong, it's my fault. If something's going to go right, I've got to make it happen. The world is happening to me. Nah. Most of what happens out there is not about me. But we kind of see it as being about us. So when... Um, uh, well, you know what I mean. You, yeah. uh, and lawyers, are, you know, lawyers like most professionals are pretty good at personalising. Um, Overgeneralisation is always this, always that. Black and white thinking: things are either good or bad, right or wrong, nice or nasty. People are either on my side or not. The world is grey, um, but when we force things into the extremes of black and white, um, and it's it's what lies at the heart of perfectionism and therefore procrastination. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, if you get 100%, well, no, if you get 70% right at O level, at GCSE, you get an A grade. At A level, you get an A grade. At university, you get first. In a law firm, if you get 70% of it right, you get seven. Um, you know, you can't, you're not allowed to, or so people think, you know, you're not allowed to make mistakes. Everything's got, you know, if it's not perfect, I'm a disaster. Um, no, that's not actually true, but that's how people think. Negative inferencing, the way we, um, The way we think what we know what people mean. Um, so I don't know, I, I walk down the road and I see, I see you tomorrow and I wave and you don't wave back. And I think, oh, I've upset her. She's angry with me. I'm a bad person. When in reality, you, know, you might not see me. Um, you might be busy. You might be pissed off with somebody else. You might be pissed off with Brendan. You might just be rude. You know? But no, no, we make it about us. We make it our fault. Um, email is a really good way of where we confuse people's meaning the whole time. Um, I don't know if you, so, I am old enough that I didn't have email when I started work. Um, but the, when we communicate normally, face to face, about 30% of our communication is words. The rest of it is our body language and our tone of voice. And that's what really helps us is that 70%. With email, all we've got is the 30%. And so we make up the rest, we infer the rest. And so when you send me an email, I've got your 30% words, and then I have to fill in the gap. And I fill it in with whatever shit is going on in here at that particular time. And if I'm having a really good time, I'm thinking you are really being nice to me. Even though you've given me a telling off, nonetheless, I see it as being a positive thing. Or if I'm having a bit of a bad time, even though you're saying, Richard, that's quite good what you did, what I hear is that was really rubbish. We infer, we make it up. Um, Slits of abstraction. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean by that, um, the way in which we you get four 
firsts in a 2-1 in your final papers. And instead of going away thinking, oh, four firsts, that's pretty good, you start worrying about the 2-1. An example. You make up, you know, you take a small part, you make all of that. You probably go. Yeah. Does that make sense? Those thinking patterns, those beliefs are sitting in between our activating event, our A and our C, and this is what causes us to get stressed. Um, and catastrophizing is a big one. Um, which leads to that, um, which is my favorite saying at the moment, just because I think something doesn't mean it's true. We go around the world thinking stuff, and most of it, most of what this says is utter nonsense. Because it's based upon the catastrophizing, it's based on this, it's based on the fact that I think really you know, doesn't like me. No, she's just rude. But, you know, now I'm really upset and miserable. Um, just because I think something doesn't mean it's true. And so being kind enough to ourselves to notice when we're having thinking that it's getting us stressed and say, hang on, do I actually need to be concerned about that again? Or am I making some stuff up here? Um, we will always be making some nonsense up. I'm going to shut up in a moment, so I'm going to skip through that, and I'm just going to tell you about this, that. Because um, some, what years are you in? I know Brendan's in his first year. So, first? And you're? And I'm like, right. Um, so, we saw those stats at the beginning about the legal profession and how there's quite a lot of mental health problems in the profession. And it's not just the legal profession, but there's quite a lot in the legal profession. Um, and there's a recognition that there's a lot of pressure. And actually, we quite like this. Lawyers quite like being here. Um, um, you know, we spend quite a lot of time there. That. And that's good. It's, you know, we, we love that cut and thrust and all the rest of it. Um, life would be boring if it was all down here. But there's an awful lot of stuff that goes on in the workplace, which is unhelpful, which is stressful and unhelpful. And if we could try and remove some of that unnecessary stuff, then we could make our workplaces healthier and more productive as a result. And this is a, an initiative which um, was begun by a couple of law firms, Pinson Masons and Upshaw Goddard, and the legal team at Barclays. So Barclays, I don't know if this is right, but so Barclays have got, a bit, have got a big legal team, and they give out loads of work. So if you are a law firm in London or Britain or anywhere else in the UK that's doing commercial type work, Barclays is gonna be a client of yours, um, like lots of other banks. Um, and when Barclays say jump, the law firms start jumping and they carry on jumping until they fall over dead because Barclays is so important, you know, like other banks, Goldman Sachs or whoever it might be. And the lawyers at Barclays said, this is a bit rubbish because we don't, first of all, we don't want to kill you. Secondly, when you're stressed, you don't do very good work because your brains aren't working. So that's not good for any of us. You know, you don't like being stressed. It's not good for your health. It's not good for the work that we get from you. So could we try to do, could we talk to each other? Shit, talk to each other. Yeah, let's have a conversation. And let's try and remove some of the unnecessary stress that goes on in our relationship, knowing that a lot of it is because your, you Barclays are really important and we law firm, we're a bit scared of you. And if we could actually just talk to each other and say, be able to say sometimes, you've asked me to, I don't know, do this particular piece of work and you've said you want it back on Monday. We can do that, but that does mean that none of us will sleep for the next five nights. We'll do it if you want, but it'll be better if we can have a bit more time. Um, things like that. And just be, you know, when you, when you say to me, can we have a meeting at eight o'clock in the morning? That's a real problem because much as I'd like to do your work, I also like taking my kids to school or I like doing yoga or I'm just really lazy. You know, eight o'clock is not good for me. Um, being allowed to have that kind of conversation. So this began a couple of years ago um, with, as I say, the lawyers of Barclays and a couple of their law firms. And then, well, it began in October 2018 with three banks, RBS, Lloyds and um, Barclays, and, not, and nine law firms, London law firms. And now, and we're, but at Burn Dean, we kind of, have, we were appointed to, promote and develop this. And we've got um, about 38 organizations now involved, um, law firms and then lots of clients, banks and others, saying, let's put this on the agenda. Let's talk about this. Let's, do some, let's try and do things differently. Um, 
And it's not, you know, we haven't solved everything overnight. But what, what we're doing with this is creating the opportunity for people to talk, to have a framework for discussion, to say, actually, you know, how we are matters, and can we try and do things in a slightly different way. So, if you are applying to law firms, for example, one of the things, or one of the things I would say you, you should think about raising, if this is of interest to you, is what do you do around mental health? And are you signed up for the mindful business chapter? And if not, why not? Um, what do you do to support your trainees' wellbeing? What do you to support? You know, what, what supports do you have in place? Where do I go to? What are the, what are the hours like here? Um, I'm going to shut up because I said I would have talked for half an hour. It's about an hour. Questions, thoughts, anything?